If you're chasing money, do not start a company. You're going to fail. If you pick a problem that you care about solving, you will be unstoppable. Luke Schoenfelder, the founder and former CEO of Latch, a multi-billion dollar technology company. We had no money when I was growing up, and I'm sitting on the top of a building that my friend owns, celebrating our IPO. I'm an astronaut. Your dad passed when you are pretty young. How did that event shape you? Looking backwards, it's changed almost everything about my life. That fight or flight response put in me this desire to create stability and structure. Starting companies was all about building something strong enough to be able to take on the world. Whatever you were lacking yeah. as a child, comes what you really overvalue to some extent yeah. as an adult, and you lacked security. And funny enough, you built a security company. We're not as complex as we want to believe. It's pretty linear. How did you overcome those feelings of depression, loneliness, substance abuse? The journey starts by finding the problem worth solving that you're willing to go and put your life force into. Run to something, not from something. How did you view success early, and what does success mean to you now? What's going on, guys? Welcome back to the World Class Podcast. Today, I sit down with my friend Luke Schoenfelder, the founder and former CEO of Latch, a security technology company that he took public in 2021. And in this conversation, we dive into Luke's journey growing up on a farm in Pennsylvania, all the way to building a multi-billion dollar technology company. We have a vulnerable conversation about how to turn your pain into your superpowers, the mindset required to be a world-class entrepreneur, and really how to build incredible businesses and be fulfilled at the same time. So without further ado, let's dive in. Well, Luke, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks so much for having me. I'm really pumped to talk to you. Your story is fascinating. Uh, you built a multi-billion dollar tech company at its peak. You took it public, but you come from a very different background. You did not come from Silicon Valley. It's true. You know, you, you came from a farm in Pennsylvania in Lancaster. Where which we, is wild that you also lived there at one point in your journey. That's which crazy. Which is a crazy, crazy coincidence Insane. there. But before we dive into how you built this company, why you built it, uh, and really how you created who you are today, uh, I want to just give the audience a little bit of context. So bring us back to Pennsylvania. What are what are some of the key moments and, and conditions of your early childhood that you feel like really paved your path? Yeah, it's a fantastic question, which I, I honestly think about a lot as you're trying to look backwards and say, okay, where were the ingredients that I remixed to create things? And I think, um, so grew up on a farm in Pennsylvania, as you mentioned, and I think that early morning going out and having to feed the cows at 6.30, um, every morning was kind of one of those things that builds a routine around work, builds a routine around responsibility. And I, I think I started doing that when I was seven or eight years old. And that was something that really gets into your bloodstream around the work ethic and routine and people depending on you or not people, but animals depending on you and being hungry and needing to take care of them. And I think that sense of responsibility was something that really was imparted to me early. And then I just loved building always. Um, and so for me, I was always building forts. So I would hollow out a you know, tree stump and turn it into a fort. I would dam one of the streams uh, and build a you know, water catchment system and all of these little projects. And I would do human capital management by recruiting neighbor kids to go be work on all these projects just because I told them it was gonna be cool, right? <laughs> and I think those are the little moments where you don't realize, but you're building these really important life skills. And so everything is obvious looking backwards, but I think those were the really foundational moments where a lot of those things you know, came into my personality, I think. That's so interesting. So you're in Lancaster, you're building things, you're, there's no technology introduction whatsoever well, at this point. Well, here's what's interesting. So my dad was a public school teacher, but had been obsessed with Apple forever. So there was a Mac computer in my house from the time that I was born. And so I'm sitting on a farm, playing with an early Mac, watching the crops get planted. And I remember at two or three years old playing this like helicopter game where I was dropping a guy, a parachuter into like a hay, hay game. And that was one of my earliest memories was playing with computers. We got, we had no money when I was growing up, but we got dial up internet super early because my dad loved technology. We had a digital camera that he'd borrowed from the computer lab in the late nineties. And I was making stop motion videos of Lego guys uh, on my computer super early. And I was also homeschooled. So my dad was a public school teacher, but my parents made the decision to homeschool me. So I was at home 
on the farm, being able to build stuff when I was done working and done learning, and I was playing with computers all day. And I think those three, four, whatever variables really combined into this, I don't know, very unique experience that I'm only starting to just now realize how unique it was. What were the things that your dad taught you that you think were different or off the beaten path of traditional education? Like what were the things your dad instilled in you that really made you who you are? I think, um, man, there's so many things, but I think it really came down to just a curiosity and an excitement about being an early adopter. So when a, the digital camera becomes a thing, let's get one and let's take photos. And it turns out they're really low resolution and you can only store eight photos on a tiny memory card, right? Not the best yet, but like we tried it really cool. And you know, I was the first person in Lancaster, Pennsylvania to get an iPhone. Uh, <laughs> I was in line for Vision Pro a few weeks ago and have been kind of an early adopter of a lot of things. Mm. And I think that comes from my dad uh, always saying, hey, this is the new thing, let's try it. Let's see how the world is gonna change because of this thing. I wanna figure <clears throat> out how you made the move from Lancaster to DC. It's a you, straight path, you know? Yeah, Just a, yeah, yeah, probably a linear path, yeah. but I wanna to touch on this because you've been open about this and I think there's some critical moments in our early lives that like really are, are game changers and they yeah. shift the way we see the world and they, they shift our trajectories. I know your dad passed when you're pretty young, yeah, right? About yeah. 13 years I old. I was 13, yeah. Or 14, 14. I 14 just years 14. old. Yep. Like how, how, how did that event shape you? Like how did that event yeah. really transform how you saw the world and the trajectory you set out to be on? It has, again, looking backwards, it's changed almost everything about my life because what it did was it set, I, I sort of saw that nobody else was going to make the world for me and preserve this pristine world that my parents had created for me, I was gonna have to do that on my own. And I think that that fight or flight response put in me this desire to create stability and to create structure around myself that was gonna protect me from the world. And starting companies and building things was all about building something big enough and strong enough to be able to take on the world. Uh, and I think that that really came about because I did not, I lost that stability that I had had when my dad passed away. Um, and so it's really, I've had a, a year since I left uh, as chairman and CEO and co-founder at Latch. And I think this last year, I've really thought a lot about that and what were the positive things that I took away from having to have that responsibility at such an early age, like thrust upon me, mm -hmm. how has that made me the leader that I am? But then also where are the blind spots? Where are the weak spots? And there's an Andy Grove quote, which I love, which is only the paranoid survive. And there's a certain paranoia that you have to have to be a successful CEO. You have to look around every corner. You have to anticipate a competitor's move. You have to understand what the dynamics in your team are. But at a certain point, it's a great way to run a business and it's a bad way to run a life. Um, and I think that trying to separate those two things out more, we're saying it's totally okay to be paranoid in your work life and look at things very critically and say, what are all the risk mitigation strategies we need to put in place? But in your personal life, try to find that stability, try to find the people in your life that you can trust and rely on unconditionally. And it's gonna be a smaller list than you think it is. Um, but when you find those people, you hang on to them and you protect them and they protect you at all costs. And I think that's been something that in the last year, I've really reflected on um, as I think about the things I want to carry forward in my next ventures, as I'm advising management teams, as I'm starting companies, um, but then also the things I want to leave behind. That's a remarkable insight. I think one thing I've learned is that your voids create your values. Mm, yeah. Whatever you were lacking yeah. as a child yeah. becomes what you really overvalue to some extent yeah. as an adult. Yeah. And you lacked security. Yes. Right. And so now it's like, Hey, the whole world, I'm, I'm, I'm vulnerable in this world. I need to create structures, whether it's a fort, yeah. whether it's a company and building financial security and stability, yeah. but you lack security. Yeah. Uh, and funny enough, you built a security company. I, it's a, that's focused on the home. That's uh, focused on the home where you felt I, most vulnerable and least secure, yeah. which is I think in hindsight, a beautiful realization because I think oftentimes we feel shame or guilt around, you know, early events in our lives, but we realize in hindsight that they're actually superpowers. It's crazy you yeah, point that out because I, um, I got off a phone call and I kind of knew that we were gonna go public after this phone call. It went a particular direction and I'm like, okay, this is happening, this is the thing. 
And I went on a walk to just sort of process it. And I'm a pretty stoic person. And I just started crying just on a walk in LA because I had figured out that that stability moment had arrived. And now I had to deal with everything else that I'd sort of shut down. And I was thinking about my dad. Um, and I was thinking about the things that he'd given to me. And I ended up um, writing my IPO sort of speech in a rough form that night because of that stability moment had arrived. And I have an amazing uh, executive coach and mentor, this guy named Ren Vara. And he helped me sort of understand the difference between personal and private. And what I had written was somewhat personal, but it was almost too private. It was the wrong moment to share this in a business context. But then about six months later, I got to give the speech at graduation at Georgetown where I was, uh, uh, you know, where I graduated. And I got to use and talk about a lot of those things. And, you know, one of the stories that I shared there um, was about, so my dad, we, again, we had no money when I was growing up. And so my dad, when he was getting his master's degree to become a public school teacher, um, he delivered pizzas for Pizza Hut. And the deal was that at the end of your shift, you got to take home any mistake pizzas. So any pizzas that were rejected by a customer for having the wrong toppings, you got to take home. And so my childhood is filled with eating mistake pizza. And as I was thinking about that, designing one of our products that was designed to make deliveries faster. So when you order DoorDash or whatever, they have to go to the intercom at the front of your building and get in. Well, as I was designing that, I was thinking a lot about my dad and thinking about the fact that I wanted that delivery person to finish their job faster, to make more money so they could get home to their family faster. And I didn't realize until five years later that the whole reason I was designing that product in that way was because I knew my dad had been a delivery person and that that was what kept him from coming home to us. And it was just one of these crazy realizations when you recognize that we're not as complex as we want to believe, it's pretty linear. It's like, your dad was a delivery person. You're designing a product for delivery people. You're designing for your dad. Wow. Boom. And wow. never in my conscious mind yeah. that I sit in a room in a three or four year development cycle for this device and think like, okay, what would my dad, how would my dad have used this product? Mm. But then in the end, you're like, okay, this is what I was doing. That's so fascinating. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> quick aside here, and then I'm going to keep in your story. It's so funny because I see a lot of parallels here. When I was a kid, I remember feeling very alone on the outside of things all the time. And I just wanted to be in the circle. Yeah. I, moved, I moved all the time with yeah. my mom's job we talked about. She was opening up malls all over. So didn't have stability either. Didn't really have good friend circles I was able to build. Felt like kind of like a loner. And then fast forward, you know, I run a super recruiting power. company. Like I am a super connector as my, as my job. So the person who felt very alone as a child now created a community and a network so he could never be alone. It's right. And and you, you probably have recognized this, but the skills that you get from having to move frequently enable you to build quick relationships with people. Yes. That's another thing. I, I was homeschooled and then I went to, I never went to any school for more than two years after that. So I went back in seventh grade because we moved, a bunch of stuff happened. And you just have to show up in a new environment and yeah. say, what's going on? What's the situation? Let me figure it out. Yeah. And I think you, just based on what I know about you in the limited context, you say, well, what's the, what's the best lunch table to be at? Because if I'm going to have to start from scratch, I might as well go to the best lunch table. Yeah, and be <laughs> someone that you'd want to sit at a uh, lunch table with. 100%. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think that's a, a great point. And it's so funny how those things end up creating who you are. And I guess if we were, if we were to keep following your story, you're in Pennsylvania. Your dad yeah. had a huge impact on you. We've got some good context of S small town, small as you town, know. not a lot of money. Nope. So how do you, uh, maybe, I, maybe before we get into Georgetown, talk about Apple. I feel like Apple plays a me. big role in, in your trajectory. It, yeah. it does. And, and so like, um, again, Apple is the world's, well, I guess not today, but will, is one of the world's most valuable companies. I think it's number two. I think Microsoft surpassed it last week, but this is late nineties, right? This is before Steve jobs has come back. And my family is like an Apple family. So when Steve jobs comes back to Apple, I remember vividly being like, this is the biggest thing that's ever happened. And <laughs> being so invested in 
the story because it's this incredible story of the prodigal son returning to run the company that they started, right? And so to see that happen and to be there with my dad experiencing this story, we watched sports together, but this was like our thing was watching the technology. I remember when the first iMac came out, the uh, colored iMac, um, which was this totally like out of left field product that created the entire design wave around it. Fast forward another crazy thing, my co-founder at Latch was on the team at Apple who designed that colored iMac. And like all of these dots just connected such a fascinating way, but I always loved technology. That was a thread. I always loved Apple above all else. And so when I'm 18, Apple announces that they're opening an Apple store at Park City Center in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, which sounds like your mom helped uh, open or transition yep. to Westfield. Um, and so I go to a recruiting interview uh, and was able to, I think it was the youngest or one of the youngest people at the store. So I'm 18, 19 years old and the app store hasn't launched yet. The iPad hasn't launched yet. And I got to be with customers all day talking about Apple and talking about the iPhone and talking about how apps and software were gonna restructure the world around us for you know a full-time job effectively, which was this incredibly transformative thing for me because I got to realize that there was this path beyond small town. I thought I'd be either a doctor or a lawyer to get out. Those were the only two like white collar jobs I could really wrap my mind around. And I'm like, I don't wanna be a doctor. So I guess I'll be a lawyer and I'll be a lawyer who's just interested in technology. And so mm. I'm at Apple. I then get an opportunity to transfer colleges to Georgetown because I was at a small state school in Pennsylvania at the time. And at the same time about to transfer to Georgetown, Apple announces they're opening an Apple store in Georgetown. And my boss from Lancaster, this amazing woman named Charmaine, is gonna become the manager of that store. So as I need to transfer, she is able to take me with her to open this new store and to move to Georgetown and sort of like start this new life in DC, but having a cocoon of people around me that I knew, that I trusted. And Charmaine went on to be able to sponsor me to get into Apple corporate and to work on the policy team, which was fascinating. At that point in time, when I got to move to the policy team, there was 10 people in the world that touched anything related to governments. Now I think there's like 200. So it was just such a crazy environment to be in. And that taught me a bunch of things. One, I love Apple. The value system that they set in place permeates every decision and every conversation. And I think that is something that's like hard. Everyone talks about the value of values, but to have one that can last for 40 or 50 years and still have people in a, in a room mm -hmm. making decisions based on that core value set, I saw how important that was to get right in a culture. And when I saw what the lawyers around me in the policy office were doing every day, I knew that I loved technology. I knew that I loved international business. And I knew that I didn't want to be a lawyer. <laughs> that was like <laughs> very clear. And I then, when I realized that, I'm like, well, what, do I, what else would I do? And I looked back at my life and I'm like, well, you've always been building things, but you never gave yourself permission to say this is what you're doing. You always said this is a side project. And so mm. like one of my side projects was I had, in, I had developed this new type of housing technology that we were... Um, working with Habitat for Humanity for in Haiti after the earthquake. This is while I was a college student and while working at Apple. And I didn't even count that as like, oh, this could be a job, like coming up with a new technology, going to a new market and building it. It was like, well, no, that can only be a side project because I have to be a lawyer in order to find the stability and su professional success. Interesting. And so it was that sort of like unlock where I'm like, okay, you're your pinnacle company. You're your like pinnacle job for being a lawyer at the intersection of like policy, business, technology. And you're not like this isn't it, I realized then that I needed to give myself permission to say, no, you're going to be a founder and you're just going to build stuff and that's gonna be your thing. Wow. Um, and so that was how sort of the way that Apple enabled me to be there. And then fast forward, again, you just can't make this stuff up. My dream was to be in an Apple keynote in one way or another. It's like, it would be super cool to be on stage and like see your logo. So the day that we went public, was the day of the WWDC Apple keynote. And that was when we were in the keynote for the first time. Wow. Same day. That's incredible. So we left NASDAQ and we went back to the hotel and had the watch party for the keynote on the same day. And it was so funny because people that morning and that weekend were like, was this your dream? And I'm like, I never 
like cared about taking a company public. I never even cared that much about like some arbitrary level of business success. I cared about being in an Apple keynote. So I'd be like, no, I'm excited for this afternoon. That that, was, that's the dream. You were more that's excited for yeah. that than going yeah, we, public. We rang the bell. That was cool. But like, yeah. did you see our logo during the keynote? That's Sick. That is cool. Um, so how, how did this come to be then? So you're at Apple, you're on yes. the policy team, you're getting acquainted with some deeper security things. Yep. You're working on a project mm -hmm. here that's yep. tangentially related to what would later become Latch. Yeah. But like, what was that transition? Was it, did you go from Apple and just burn the boats and say, I'm going in? What was the transition so, from Apple to starting Latch? Yeah, so I got a, I won a Marshall Scholarship, which is a scholarship from the United Kingdom where you get basically a blank check to study anything at any school in the UK. Um, and so again, I'm like free grad school, I should take this. But I was just starting another company. Kind of the first thing that I gave myself permission to do was in Haiti, I had discovered this problem around energy distribution. So we don't think anything about it. We flip on the light switch, no big deal. But in a lot of the rest of the world, uh, power is not something you have 24 seven. It's intermittently available. And there's a bunch of problems. A lot of it relates to um, what's called non-technical losses, which are people basically tapping the power lines and siphoning power off of the grid, which crashes the grid and all that stuff. So we, a small team uh, of folks that I knew, came up with a new type of smart meter technology that enabled us to basically track uh, payments, track other things. And that was really the first thing that I did after I left Apple and while I was starting grad school. So this is a you know crazy like full circle moment. Uh, I ended up starting that company, had raised about a hundred thousand bucks, which at the time seemed like, you know, oh my God, like this is, this is in insane that somebody's investing in this idea to bring it to fruition. And I was super grateful for that. Um, and so as we were, uh, taking this thing to, to, you know, to the next stage, we're going to raise more money. Um, I had just gotten a handshake deal on a large seed round or our series a, or whatever we would have called it. And I then opened up my phone and I saw a red letter headline on Drudge Report. So everybody in DC reads Drudge Report every day. And there was this red letter headline that said, 34 people arrested in money laundering sting uh, and sports betting scheme uh, by the FBI. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting. I click on it and I start reading through and I'm like, I know that person, I know that person, I know that person. And effectively, um, if you have seen Molly's Game, this was that same Molly's Game crew of people who were sports betting, doing poker, get these high stakes poker games with all the celebrities, blah, 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 blah. They were angel investors in my company. When the FBI came in and froze all of their assets, they did not let the, those angel investors sign off on the ROFR to allow future investment into the company. So I'm sitting there as a 22, 22, 23 year old, having my first like idea that I think can go the distance with a handshake to invest the money, not able to do anything and having to shut the company down. Wow. Okay. And so that happens, I'm finishing my thesis for my master's and I end up back on the couch of a dear friend, Ann Rollins, who is my boss at Apple. And she, she was very involved in Apple in Asia. So she was gone in Singapore for like two months and in Asia for two months, she said, you can live at my house for free. And as I was sitting there, you know, I started to think about the problems that I wanted to solve. And it was at a, a dinner uh, over, do you know Baja Fresh? Yeah. It's like the cheapo version of Chipotle. Yeah. And I was at dinner with my, who, the per, Druva who'd gone to be my co-founder. Um, and I remember ordering and not getting the guacamole cause I couldn't afford it. And it was over that dinner that we realized that we could do something really interesting around this problem of access. And basically, if you think about most things in real estate, it comes down to letting somebody in. You sign a lease, you get the keys. You need to let in the plumber, they need the keys. You wanna invite a friend over, they need the keys. And this sort of like choke point was gonna be the physical choke point for all the digital services, whether it be Airbnb, UPS, FedEx, et cetera, that were gonna be involved in going into a building. And now again, this all seems obvious, but this is 2013. And so uh, Amazon uh, doesn't sell groceries yet. Amazon isn't a logistics company. Airbnb is just a new thing. Uber is just a new thing. And we saw what was gonna happen with the availability of smartphones, the availability of smartphone components, and the on-demand economy kind of all crashing into the front door and saying, okay, how do we build something that is digital infrastructure for the physical world? And that, was, that was the thesis um, yeah. from, from the jump. So that's brilliant. So 
if you want to just explain to the audience, this is the precursor for what would become Latch. Mm -hmm. You're identifying this problem. So what exactly is Latch? Yeah, totally. And, and why did you build it? Yeah, so Latch is a system of hardware, software, and services that enables the building to have one uh, app to unlock their doors, let in their guests, uh, send access to services, all from just their phone. And so we built a set of hardware devices that would get installed at every door in a building. So the building entrance, the garage, the gym, the parking gate, um, the roof deck. Um, and with that infrastructure installed, you're able to use an app on your phone, a card in your wallet, or a temporary code to give access and manage access for anybody. Um, and we were able to, through that, uh, have an app that uh, in 2022 was used more than 100 million times um, which is crazy. And it's amazing to be here in Miami where so many of our products ended up because there was such a big new construction boom over the last few years. So as I've been Airbnb waiting for my place to be done, I've Airbnb incidentally a latch building. I live in a latch building. Um, and those experiences of being able to use the product every day that you made is cool. It's also scary because you see, you're like, oh, I designed that eight years ago. I wish I would have done this differently. <laughs> uh, and so it's been, it's yeah. been fun to yeah. see it out in the world and to be able to uh, have a product that people get to interact with multiple times a day. What was your mindset at the time when you were starting these companies? Because you seem uh, initially going back to your story, you really value stability and security. Yeah. You're still broke. You can't afford guacamole, right? Like, how do you reconcile that? Because there's a lot of people listening that might not be in financial well-off positions yet, or they, they don't have that security yet. So like, oh, I gotta go follow this path I'm not really excited about yeah. for X amount of time until I have this feeling of security. So then I can go take a big bet. But you were like, no, screw it. I'm just gonna do it now. Like, how did you reconcile that? What was your mindset? I, I think, and again, I would love to say that I was this organized about thinking about it at the time, but I think that the opportunity cost is the lowest the earlier you are in your career. So what's the worst thing that happens if you are a founder CEO of a company that fails or you're an analyst for two years at a consulting firm? I mean, your opportunity cost isn't that high. If you wait till you're about to make managing director or partner in your 30s, the opportunity cost is super high. And I think that you're almost better off getting on the founder path and trying it mm -hmm. before you found this other middling stability yeah. because that is hard to give up. And I think that maybe subconsciously I knew that if I got on that path, it would be hard for me to ever get back into building things. Mm. I don't know. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. But I think the time, I encourage people to start as young as possible because I mean, you're around so many founders, you've started you know things yourself. Like the reality is that everybody's just figuring it out there's no book about how to do any, I mean, there's many books that have been written, but there's no like one guide that you can just follow and you're gonna be successful. Bet on yourself when you're young, hungry and foolish. That is the best time because you have nothing to lose. Go for it, burn the boats. And I think, you know, I remember this moment where I thought that I was gonna to have to take a consulting job because I literally had zero dollars and I was at a retreat uh, for Sandbox. I don't know if you know Sandbox. It was a, a big organization about 10 years ago uh, for entrepreneurs, kind of like a secret network or whatever. And I was at this event and this woman was talking about how millennials are terrible with their 401ks because we don't understand them. And then as soon as we hit hard times, we cash out our 401ks and it's awful for our retirement. I'm like, say more about that. And I realized that I had a 401k for my time at Apple and I cashed it out and I had like four grand and that was what I was able to support myself with and pay for the first prototypes and do all that stuff for Latch. And I think that was the moment of like, burn the boats. And I guess I would say like, there's no better time to bet on yourself than when you're young. I, I completely agree with that message. So I wanna, I wanna figure out what, what you feel like made Latch so successful, why you were able to be successful. You mentioned from the jump, that you saw from Apple, how important it was to clearly define your core values. Yes. And know who you are as a company so you can make all of your decisions, all of your hiring decisions, everything based around these core values, have a clear North Star. When you were starting Latch, like what was your North Star? What were the core values and principles that you knew you were gonna build the company around? So again, I would say it wasn't the 
first day at the kitchen table, but I would say within the first 18, 24 months, the things that we coalesced on explicitly was this idea of humble excellence. We wanted people who were the best of the world at what they did and let the work speak for itself. And I think that attitude of humble excellence was what enabled us to build the team that we did. Um, we were able to hire a lot of folks from Apple because we, and that was really important to our early success because we wanted people who were the best of the world at what they did, but were fundamentally doers and were not looking for praise. We're looking for success. And, you know, looking back, um, there are people, this guy, uh, this amazing engineer named Ewan comes to mind who, you know, former Apple, uh, had led big projects and he was red eyeing into New York city, uh, at, on a Friday to work with us at the office on Saturday to get back on a plane Saturday night or Sunday morning to go back to San Francisco to design our products and get them ready for manufacturing because that was the only time he had available. He wasn't at Apple at the time. He was at another company, but like that type of dedication and he was probably 40 at the time right? He just showed up, did the work. It was amazing. And then went home. And I think that sort of like day in, day out dedication is something that I really, really value. And I think that early team really set the tone for this idea of humble excellence. There's no job that's too menial. There's no amount of uh, flights that is too many. Like if it needs to be done, it's going to be done and we're going to do it without fanfare. Uh, and I think that initial ethos was really what propelled us forward. I think that that's a great distillation of just what it means to be successful. You can, you can look at a lot of different traits and attributes. You can make it more complex, but really it's, it's a culture of humble excellence. Yeah. I like that. Cause there's this, there's this dichotomy with ego Yes, that I think is interesting, right? In one hand, you have to know that you are the best in the world. Like yep. Kobe Bryant, MJ, they knew they would smoke anybody that set foot on that court. Yep. But at the same time, you're humble enough to know that you're not as good as who you need to be a year from now. Yes. And you're constantly learning. You, you have this feeling and this knowing that you are the man, that you are the best in the world at your craft and you back that up with evidence and that evidence is backed up from your level of preparation and work ethic. Yes, that's totally right. And I think if I look at, uh, I look at my early, you know, my mid twenties when I was starting Latch, the ego definitely drove more than it probably should have, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> but over time, we realized like, okay, this isn't the right way to sort of push projects forward and yeah. you have to mature into that. Yeah. But I do think that if you don't have that fire in your belly to start, you're never gonna get there. This is so interesting never because get there. I love that you're so, and you know, you admire Apple so much, you admire Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs was a pretty dictatorial, intense leader, right? Yes. Like him and Steve, uh, Richard Branson, Steve Jobs, Richard Branson are almost like diametrically opposed. opposed leaders. Yeah. Um, and I think when you're looking at the type of leader you wanted to be, I understand that when you're building at first, you have scarcity, you have fear. And so you're building out of desperation instead of inspiration typically. Yes. Yeah. And you're just like, you've got to get shit done. You can, you can get a little bit too controlling and you're, just, you're an intense person. So yes. for you, as you evolved, did you notice there was a shift where you move from like dictatorial, like intense, got to get this shit done, Steve Jobs type leader-esque uh, profile to a more like love-based or inspired-based leader? I don't think so. Like I've mediated, but I, th I still believe that you have to be, bring that intensity to whatever you do, but the way that you direct that intensity has to shift. Okay. And I think what I've tried to do is I know I'm an intense person, but focus that on a problem mm. as opposed to on a person. And that is makes all the difference. And as long as the team around you knows that when you're like steaming, frustrated and mad, it's rarely about a person. It's about the contour of a metal button being too sharp when you had specifically said it shouldn't be that way. And like literally being at a level 11 in terms of intensity and frustration about the sharpness of an edge on something. And somebody may interpret that as like, you're mad at them. But generally, I don't even, I'm not even thinking about them. I'm thinking about how frustrated I am that this thing was not manufactured the way that it was supposed to be. And that I think that difference and shift is something that I've always tried to really communicate with teams now more upfront. Like, hey, I know I'm intense. I will tell you if it's something with us. I'm a very open, like, here's what I'm frustrated about. I want you to tell me what you're frustrated about with me. But like my intensity is almost always directed at a problem. 
And mm. I think that shift of how to take that intensity that you know people who are really good at what they do have and focus it, I think that's been the difference for me. That's a brilliant distinction. I, it takes me back to a story where Steve Jobs was talking with Johnny Ive. Yeah. And Johnny had put together this project. They poured their blood, sweat, and tears into it. And Steve Jobs is like, this is shit. And he's like, Steve, I thought you'd be a bit more endearing and, and compassionate knowing how hard we worked on this. And he goes, Johnny, I didn't know you were so vain. Yeah. He goes, what do you mean vain? He's like, yeah, I thought you cared about the quality of the work, but you're just afraid of letting down people and sharing news because you don't want to look bad, right? So can you get beyond yourself? I'm not, I'm not having a personal problem with you, it's but this intensity work. is about the work yeah. and this, this shared commitment to excellence. Yeah. And when you find people that are aligned with that mission, that are okay with confronting personal things and not conflating them with the work, then you start building something brilliant. I wholeheartedly agree. And I think what Apple has done really well, especially in their early years and something that I want to emulate more of, and I'd be curious in your thoughts on this is let the amount of work that you take on be dictated by the number of amazing people that are aligned with your values that you can collect as opposed to the number of people you can hire. Because what happens is when you lower the bar for hiring, because you're like, well, we got to hit these targets, we got to grow, the quality of the work that you're going to be able to do just automatically lowers. The tax that all of the really strong people are going to pay is just so much higher than people think it is. And so I wish that at various points in time, we would have kept various teams smaller and just said, okay, we're going to do less because this is what this awesome team is capable of. And we can't find more people that meet the caliber of this team. So we're going to let this awesome team constrain the amount of work wow. as opposed to doing it the other way, which most people say like, well, we have this awesome team and we now have to do this work. So we're going to add, we're going to double the size of the team. And it's like, well, can you effectively double the size of the team with really high quality people in three months? I mean, this is your business. That's a different paradigm of thinking. Uh, I'm even thinking about my own companies. You say that that's making me think because most people say, Hey, we have this much demand or the business can grow this much. We need to back into this much headcount. You're saying, let's go acquire the best talent and say, what is this team capable of? And that's, I think, especially in this moment where you can get so much leverage out of, and I'm not just saying AI to say AI, but I mean, literally code assistance, copy assistance, image creation, marketing assistance, like, all of these things, if you're really good in your tool chain of what you have in the tool set, can take a great team and give them superpowers and make them able to do twice, amount, uh, twice the amount of work as they're able to 10 years ago. And I think like it's that focusing on having that core strong team and then not taking on things that that core strong team can't handle. Very interesting. Um, and that's how I, like there are moments where you do just need to add more people and especially in data-driven roles, I think sales may be one of those areas where yeah. if you have a good training program and you have a you know really fair compensation and a re really fair policy about what success looks like, I think you could have more junior people roll into a junior sales role and either sink or swim, yeah. but I don't think that works in product development. It just doesn't. Like We don't have time to teach someone to be an amazing mechanical engineer. We need to ship this product. Yeah. And I think that's a different mindset and it's something that as i invest in companies look at uh you know the next things that i'm doing it's really about like what's the core awesome group and how much can they get done that's really really interesting so you did a great job at building the right core team keeping a really high bar on who is on that team so you can produce excellent caliber of work that seemed to go really well what were one or two other things that you feel like you guys nailed that created this asymmetric growth for you guys? Timing. I mean- Market the, timing, a market little bit of luck in there? Yeah, oh, 100%. I think two things happened uh, that were independent but ended up being amazing for us. So the explosion of global smartphone availability made the sensors, whether it be Bluetooth or cameras or NFC chips, cheap in a way that they never could have been cheap before because you had uh, all the handset manufacturers uh, you know, building hundreds of millions of devices every year. So all of a sudden the cost of a Bluetooth module went from maybe 30 bucks to eight bucks. And so you could start to build in more and more technology into physical devices. Yep. And that, so that we're a huge beneficiary of. Um, we then were a huge beneficiary of companies like Nest, uh, companies like Fitbit uh, being successfully acquired, um, going public um, because 
it really kicked off the sort of hardware 2.0 renaissance, which was, you know, 2013, 2014, 2015, right as we were getting started, where investing in physical products was something that was very exciting for investors. And so we step in and very fortunately, you know, uh, ex-Apple founding team, a lot of Apple people, that was a really attractive uh, thesis and a really attractive team to back at that point in time. And we really benefited from that. And we had so many people excited about what we were doing. And then simultaneously, you know, we were able to, I think just by being honest about what we love to do, which was build amazing things, we said, we're building an amazing door lock and we're doing it quietly and in stealth, but it's gonna be awesome. We were in stealth for three or four years. Wow. And in that time, because it takes that long to build a truly great product, we were in stealth for about three years. Um, in that time, we were able to get closed door private meetings with many of the leaders in real estate. Um, and that was why we were able to so quickly get our products into premier projects with premier developers. Were they more or less design partners? No, they no, they weren't design partners. They were customers. So we were would, customers. Yeah, already. so we would get an intro, and you know, it would be something like, "Hey, there's a team of ex Apple people working on a product at the intersection of real estate and technology. Would you take a meeting with them?" And most people, their curiosity is yeah, like, "Why not? Why not?" But a lot of a lot of times, people are building and stuff. And this is good to point out: they're building really badass technology, but then they figure out there's not a market for it, and they don't have distribution. Oh no! So we very much, to your point, I, I misunderstood your question. We were very much sounding out the non-negotiable features Got from it. these premier customers. Yeah. And so we knew, I don't know, making it up, let's say 75, 80% of the user stories were locked. It was that 20 to 25% flex yeah. that we were able to flex with customers. Um, and I think that was so valuable to have that data and to have that not just from the CEOs of big real estate companies, but then to go sit with their ops teams and get their advice and say, what are the problems you're trying to solve? Um, and then having the real estate community, so many of them invest in the company, mm. also gave us credibility in the Valley. Yeah, I'm very curious about that because it sounds like with your level of passion and conviction and your backgrounds, you were able to just build an exceptional product. But now it's like, how do we commercialize this yes. thing and make it a reality? What was your secret to distribution? How did you hack that distribution chain so you were able to get this out to the market? I think it was by, again, being authentic about how excited we were about what we were building. And you know, there was, uh, uh, I forget who it was, but there was a real estate executive who was like, why am, I, why am I in a meeting about door locks, right? And I was sort of like, I don't know, but you took the meeting and by the end they were like, okay, yeah, I understand why I'm in the meeting about door locks because this is really cool and now I care about door locks. And I think it's whatever you decide to do, do it really well. Um, and I the think- The product almost creates its own distribution. That's kind of, that's what we did. I mean, we did absolutely like, sort of like product led growth where we said, this is the product um, you should build it into your projects. And by the way, here's all the people who have built it into their projects. And here are all the people who are investing in the company. And I think that we needed to have that really strong cohort of real estate folks, both as uh, customer insight, customer validation, investor insight, but then also for marketing purposes to go to the next important real estate developer and say, hey, we don't have a pinnacle project in San Francisco yet, but here's like the who's who of New York real estate that has backed the project and has backed our products. Uh, why don't you guys back it as well? And I think finding the people that were able to provide that insight, but then also help us get into, get into market um, quickly was really, really critical. So you guys did a lot of things right, but you're a very reflective person, Yeah. right? You wanna go back and look at all the dots, see how they connected. Yes. So in 2020 hindsight, what were the biggest fuck ups? Literally 2020? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. I mean, I think that was such a, there was such a uh, crazy moment of, you know, when you hit that like hyperscaling, hyper growth moment, you are, have the trajectory of the business and you know that you need more people. And so you start to change the way that you hire and you start to do more things by committee and you start to r relax on maybe some of the values because you're like, well, maybe that was right for the early days, but it wasn't right for now. And I think that relaxing those core values mm -hmm. was a mistake. Mm -hmm. And I think that when I look back at my mistakes, 
it's really a failure to adhere to the value set from those early, those early days. Um, and so an internal inconsistency with ourselves is probably the biggest failure point. And then look, market timing, it's, mm-hmm. The market's great for growth tech until it's not. It's yeah. great for prop tech and real estate till interest rates are crazy. Like there was a lot of things that were outside of our control, yeah. but there was a lot of things that were inside our control. And mm-hmm. I think one of the biggest ones was being able to, uh, again, like stay true to those core values mm-hmm. as we scaled the team. And I think we, we didn't do that in the way that I would have loved to do in hindsight. What would you say was the highest high and the lowest low? Ooh, okay. I mean, there's so many. I'll go lowest low first because it's the most vivid memory. Um, so you would not think this. Door locks are kind of boring, but they're actually one of the most regulated like categories of products because they're a life safety and fire safety product. So the door lock is what prevents a fire from the hallway from getting into the apartment or apartment uh, fire in the apartment from getting out into the hallway. So there's these crazy fire tests that all the products have to go through. You don't know any of this stuff. Like an entrepreneur told me once, you never would start the company that you end up running. Because if you knew how hard it was gonna be, you'd be like, oh no, no, bad market. I'm gonna go do something else. So it's like your own ignorance. And so we've designed this amazing product. We now have to go through what's called UL, Underwriters Laboratory Testing for fire safety. and. Our product, which is supposed to just sail through because of all of our experts and design and blah, 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 lights on fire. And then it lights on fire again. And then it lights on fire again. So they're in this crazy furnace where they're slowly cranking up the temperature to 2000 degrees Fahrenheit and it can't catch on fire. And so I'm sitting there being like, oh my God, we're not gonna be able to, if we don't pass this test, we cannot be installed in any apartment buildings and we are not going to be able to take this product to market. At this point, we've raised our series A, we're, I don't know, 15, $20 million of fundraising in and we don't have a product that we can sell unless we pass this test. And I remember there's only really one lab in the US where you can do it, it's in Northbrook, Illinois. So we'd fly out, we'd have our boxes full of locks, we'd install them and then we'd watch them catch on fire. And I think oh like, Literally seeing your dreams light up in flames, those were the lowest points. And we ended up, I called my uncle who has been um, one, an engineer on a lot of different NASA programs for like 30, 40 years. And I'm like, hey, Uncle Mark, what's a plastic that can last to 2000 degrees Fahrenheit? Because he works on space products. And he's like, there is no plastic that can last to 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. And I'm sitting there and be like, oh man, like <laughs> we're, we're in trouble. But what we figured out, and this was like a brilliant engineer on the team, was that if we could make the plastic parts out of a material that didn't catch on fire, but instead dissolved, then our exoskeleton of metal would provide all the fire safety benefits. And basically all of the plastic would just dissolve harmlessly, like into dust. So we pivoted, we're able to do that. We're able to pass the test. We're able to sell the products and blah, 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 like off to the races. We never really had that problem again. Um, and I think that was, in future products, we never had that problem. And I think that was probably the lowest low. I think highest high, I think there's nothing that compares to seeing your product installed in the wild and used in the wild. So I moved to a block in New York City on Ludlow Street. Um, and when I moved into the apartment, there were there was one or there was two latch locks installed in the world. One was on an investor's door, one was on my apartment door. And when I left that block three, four years later, there was like seven buildings, latch buildings within a two block, three block radius on my way to the subway. And being able to walk to work and be like, that was on a conference room wall. It, we, I drew that. And now it's out. Just seeing your ideas and your dreams physically manifested helping society. It's crazy. And right. being like, I know where that, the conference room where that was created. I know how we worked on it in San Francisco. I know the factory in China because I was there when it came off of the line. Yeah. And here it is. And somebody's just using their phone to get into their front door now. I think there's something powerful in that mm-hmm. because you could have said the IPO day when you're standing. I, you know, that, that, that's a cool experience. But what that signals to me about you and I think about successful entrepreneurs, and this is important for people thinking about starting companies, you think about the accolades, you think about how cool you're gonna look, how much money you're gonna make, but that tends to not be the mindset of the most successful entrepreneurs. You're focused on creating and maximizing your gifts to create something that impacts the world in some way. 
And that's the primary driver. The alkylades, the money is a shadow of that. It's totally right. You, you can only see those things as trailing uh, markers if you are chasing, if you're chasing money, do not start a company. It is, you're going to fail. You will pick something that makes sense on paper, but you won't have the passion to sort of sustain you the whole way through. If you pick a problem that you care about solving, you will be unstoppable because as long as you don't give up, you will solve that problem. And then the question is, well, was that problem valuable to society or not? Was the timing of that solution right? Right, And we don't know. There's so many things that you just could never predict that would end up changing the course of the company. But if that problem, if you solve the problem and the problem ends up being valuable, everything else will work out. That is such a gem, I love that. So take me to that moment, I'm just curious. I think a lot of people, entrepreneurs, whether they're venture capital back yeah. or bootstrapping, whatever it is, there's like this idea of your Super Bowl moment. Yeah. Whether it's selling your company, whether it's making X amount of money, the IPO, you're standing in New York at Times Square, you just taken your company public. Uh, it's, wor it's worth billions of dollars at, at the height of its market cap, but you're standing there on the podium. What was that experience like for you? And was it, thought what you, was it like what you thought it would be? It's so interesting because I never had imagined doing it. And so I did not have some like preconceived pedestal moment of, okay, it needs to meet this expectation. Yeah. And so I think I was able to just really go and have it be part of the experience. Mm -hmm. But there's a quote that I thought about a lot. Um, did you watch Mad Men ever? I uh, loved Mad okay, Men. Okay, it's one of my favorite shows. Yeah, absolutely and love that show. This is a deep cut, so you may not remember this, but when Miss Blankenship, who's Burt Cooper's secretary, dies, they go to Burt Cooper and they're like, you have to write the obituary. And he says, well, she was born uh, in the 1890s in a barn, and she died on the 40th floor of the Time Life Building in New York City. She was an astronaut. Print it. And I think there was a moment for me when we were sitting at this rooftop it, that we had uh, uh, rented out at Rockefeller Center the day of the IPO, being like, I grew up on a farm in Pennsylvania and I'm sitting on the top of a building that my friend owns celebrating our IPO, I'm an astronaut. And I think that moment for me was that full circle moment that I really felt it. I felt like the pressing the button and ringing the bell, it was, I was in work mode because you're there, you have all the cameras, you have all of the team, everybody's watching you. It wasn't as much of like a personal moment of reflection. Whereas when you have the second to look out at New York City and start to say, I know the person who owns that building, I know there's a latch building there, I know that and visually see the world around you, that was the moment for me. That, that is very cool. I want to read something that you wrote, uh, or more, more actually spoke. You gave a speech at University of Georgetown. And I want to transition to some more like life wisdom because yeah. you've had a lot of success, but I think you're also extremely intuitive and, and wise. You're very kind. You're very uh, kind. But I want to read this back to you and have you elaborate a bit because I think this is really powerful. So you said, each of our lives can be summarized as a sentence, a collection of nouns and verbs that make up our stories. My full biography would highlight that I've been a failure at almost everything. I've been an educational failure. I nearly failed out of two high schools and I attended two other colleges before transferring to Georgetown. I've been a professional failure. I've crashed and burned at no fewer than five ventures. I have been a personal failure, including substance abuse as a teenager, depression and loneliness in many periods of my life. Now those failures have been glossed over. I have dined with presidents, drank with royalty, rang the bell at NASDAQ, read my name in the biggest newspapers, and been on TV a few times. Most people focus on these snapshots, the noun and the sentences that represent each of our lives for identity and meaning. But the reality is that nouns are just artifacts, powerless themselves. The school we went to, the jobs we had, the awards we won, they all make up a list of proud nouns that we use to define ourselves and signal to the world about who we are. While your life can include a long list of nouns, I've seen that it is always the verbs that actually push the world forward, sometimes in small ways and sometimes in big ways. We owe the world the power of our verbs, the best we're capable of because that's what actually matters. What, what did you mean by that? What were you trying to communicate there? I, we were talking before about sort of idolizing these snapshot moments. They never feel the way that you think they're going to feel. And if you chase those, you're gonna have a very empty life. If you wake up 
and you do things, you verb things in a way that matters to you, you will be satisfied in a way that is hard to express. And the nouns will follow because somebody will see what you're doing and will say, this person deserves a noun now. Here's a noun, you get a noun. And those moments are only possible because of the verbs. And people who look at how they achieve the nouns and look at the checklist of what they have to do, they probably will never get the noun. And if they do, it will be hollow. Mm. Like that is what I've learned is that it's the verbs of pushing things forward that actually result in all of the nouns. And if you just chase the nouns and focus on that, you're gonna be really unsatisfied. That is a brilliant uh, distinction too, because you're saying the noun might be public CEO or successful entrepreneur, or whatever it may be. And we get so obsessed with these labels we want to identify with that we over glamorize those things instead of actually focusing on the right verbs that can get us there in the first place and just focus on the doing. That's it. And like, I got to be a public company CEO because I put boots on every day and either went to a skyscraper in New York or a factory in China. And that is how I got to be there. Not because I went through some checklist of, oh, how to become a public company CEO. Like that doesn't exist. And if that's what you're trying to do, you're gonna fail. Whereas if you just get up and are authentically working on a problem that you care about and verbing every day, it's all gonna work out, hopefully. I, if the market timing works and all those things. I love that. And I think maybe to even expand on that, I'd love to get your, your take on this because I was thinking about this and I was thinking about the place of adjectives too. Yeah. Like there's the work that needs doing, but there's also who you're being inside of that work. Yeah. Right. You can, you can yeah. do something kindly, you know, brashly, yes. dictatorially. Yes. And it's like, who are you being in the process? Cause like, what if you do all the doing and you go public and you make billions of dollars, but the adjectives in the way you were working throughout that process was you were a dick. You weren't nice to people. You were, you, you, you felt anger and guilt, whatever it may be that was driving you. And you have all the doing, you get the label, but your way of being creates a source of emptiness. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> that is exactly, I mean, that, that so often happens. And I think that the best, uh, the people who are truly great often have periods of imbalance mm -hmm. because you have to live in an imbalanced way, I think, yeah. mm -hmm. to, to really do exceptional crazy things. But you have to look at that as a moment in time to then float back to a state of balance, to then go to those points where you're gonna have to be in a state of imbalance again. Yes, And yes. most people live their life imbalanced, but without an objective. They're just sort of like unregulated and imbalanced without an objective. Mm. If you can say, okay, I'm gonna be imbalanced, I'm going to not get enough sleep, I'm going to have too much caffeine, but holy moly, am I gonna like be able to achieve this thing and then return to a state of balance? As long as you're able to manage that, I do think that's how the most successful people operate. And that's yeah. why I worry there, I saw a thing on, uh, on Twitter the other day about how many people, once they become successful, start to give their like life routines. I think Jeff Bezos, who's someone I admire, you know, talking about doesn't do any work before 11, doesn't do this, doesn't do that. And you're like, that was not, that sounds like a very balanced life. That was absolutely not Jeff Bezos in 97. Yeah, people look at people at the peak and they're and like, like, well, I'm gonna copy them. No, emulate them yeah. when they were at the level that you are at now. That's, and that's what a lot of people miss out on. Yeah. They're like, well, Mark Zuckerberg's daily routine is, yeah. he's got hot yoga and then he has this and he has this. And it's like, well, he's reached a point in his career where it's actually being in balance and having the mental presence of mind to manage incredibly challenging intellectual things, not just like the brute physical strength, to stay up coding, the brute physical strength to mm -hmm. just push through, that wanes, the value of that wanes over time. You, you bring up a good point, like you have to figure out how to regulate yourself. Yes. Whether you wanna be successful in anything, it doesn't matter if you wanna be a billion dollar founder or be the best artist, like learning how to regulate yourself is, is critical. And I find that your emotional regulation tends to be the ceiling on your success. Yes. Right? How well can you regulate your emotions, your stress levels, and really deal with yourself? Yeah. Like you are your biggest bottleneck. You are, always. You, you, you've been open about it too, like early in, in your childhood, and I haven't shared this publicly, but like I struggle with the same things with substance abuse, loneliness, depression. Um, and I feel like because I felt those things in such a profound sense, and that pain wasn't just like, you know, the, 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 the lobster and, and slowly boiling water, it was so intense for yeah. me that it forced me to create mechanisms to go 
build a character that could combat those things. But for you, I'm sure there's people listening to that are struggling with loneliness, depression, self-sabotaging, and they just can't seem to get out of their own way, but they have all this potential. They just don't know how to direct it, right? They're wandering yeah. without a purpose. They're not regulating themselves. So I'm curious for you, like, how did you overcome those feelings of depression, loneliness, you know, substance abuse, all these things going on for you? How were you able to overcome those things and become productive and, and get into your power? I think that it's always a journey. And I think that the journey starts by finding something in your life that you want to change. And for me, it was finding problems that I cared enough about solving and that I cared more about solving than self-medicating, right? I cared enough about building housing technology as again, as lame as that may sound, find your lame thing that you care about more than anyone else and let that, that be the thing that drives you forward. And so for me, I wanted to build this prototype of a particular new construction technology. And I was 18, 19 years old. And it was like, this is a big enough motivator for me to get up in the mornings before work and do this. This is a big enough motivator to recruit friends to come help me do this. Mm. And that was what kind of like pulled me out of it. Yeah. It was going to the Apple store and being like, okay, I get to wear an Apple logo on my shirt because I'm part of this thing. I'm gonna go out and have the best like experience for customers. I'm gonna go out and do that because I care about this problem and I care about people being excited about technology. This is a problem worth solving. And I think find a problem that you uniquely care about solving and that will take care of a lot of the rest of it. And it's not, I've seen, ther I see a therapist. I've seen like all of those things are super important. Eating well, sleeping, you know, avoiding drugs and alcohol, like all of those things are super, super critical. But I think at the end, you also have to find something that's a problem worth solving that you're willing to go and put your life force into. That's a great distinction because I think what I took from that is you have your current self without a vision. And so without a vision for the future, you'll always return to the habits of the past. Correct. Right. And so whether you're medicating to kind of mask the emotions you feel of guilt or anger or frustration that you're not where you want to be, uh, that you don't have what you want to have. But then when you have a vision, you're almost pulled forward into becoming your future self. Run to something, not from something. That's it. And I think for me, I was running from something and running to something. Mm -hmm. And that was great. Mm -hmm. But if you can just pick running to something, that is a much better way of sort of, I think, orienting yourself. Because for I me, like that. Mm -hmm. I ignored a lot of the things that I was running from yep. for too long. And if I would have confronted those things earlier, it would have made me better at running to something as well. What was one of those things? I'm so curious. Like, what was the thing I mean, you had to come up against within yourself to then step into your power and become who you are today? I, I mean, I think the fear of abandonment. I mean, having your parent you know, it wasn't a choice, but my father died from cancer very, you know, ra rather abruptly feeling that that stability was going to be taken and that the people closest to you were not going to be there for you. They were just going to disappear. Mm. I think that was a deeply felt fear that really had negative impacts on me in a lot of different aspects of my life. Has that fear gone away? I am engaged to somebody who's absolutely amazing, who you met at dinner. Yeah. Uh, Rachel is, I think, really changed the way that I view the world and view myself. Because when you find someone who is that ultimate partner, who is going to be there for you in really difficult moments, you realize that that's what you need. You don't need 50 people that are there for you, you need five. And if you have 50, amazing, yes, yes. but you need that person and you need those people around you. And that getting to have her in my life in that way has really changed the way that I view abandonment and view my own stability yeah. in a really powerful way. And yeah. I know that I'll build, be able to build so much more in or solve more problems, whether that's building companies or, you know, investing in things or donating to things like that confidence comes from that stability that we have together. I love that, man. And I, you might've already just touched on it, but I was also just curious to get inside your mind back when you were in your twenties starting latch to where you're at now. I'm really curious about the evolution. Like how did you view success early? And like, what does success mean to you now? It is pretty much the same, which is building things that you're proud of. And I, I think going to that like verbs and nouns thing, 
building something you're proud of is the thing that I've always been chasing. And the noun seemed to follow that. And, you know, Brian, uh, who's my other co-founder at Latch, we would just look at each other and be like, we're going to ship something awesome. We don't know if the market timing is going to be right. We don't know if the customer is going to be there, but we're going to build something awesome. And that has to be what drives us forward. Not the next round, not the next this. If yeah. we're building something awesome, then we have to believe that it's going to work out. I love it. Uh, quick question before I have my final question. Yeah. Where can our audience engage with you and follow you online? Yeah. So I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Twitter. Uh, shoot me a message either place. Uh, my email is just my first name, last name at me.com. Uh, so shoot me a message anytime if you're working on a new venture or want some life advice or perspective. I don't know if it'll be advice, but perspective. I'm always happy to share and uh, share parts of my journey with anybody. Amazing. We'll link that in the show notes. And final question here. For me, being world class, what this show is all about, this pursuit of greatness, uh, your own personal legend, if you will. Um, I think it's just a constant journey of expansion, of constantly using your gifts, trying to become a greater version of yourself, building new things, and it can look a lot of different ways. So after taking a company public, you know, you've got your fiance, you've got this beautiful life you've built for yourself. What does your next level look like? It's a great question. Um, I think, and I've spent the last year really focusing on, on what that looks like. And I know that I love building things. I know that I love being a leader of teams. And I know that I love solving really, really hard problems. And so I think it's, looking at the hardest problems and the problems that I'm most motivated in solving and finding the right groups of people to attach to those problems. And that matchmaking between problems and people and putting teams together to say, this shouldn't be this way in the world, who's someone who could fix that and working with them to create something is just awesome. Uh, and I think that next version of success for me looks like really getting to build alongside people that I deeply respect and value. There, again, there's a quote that somebody told me once, which is that you become the average of the five people that you spend the most time with. And for me, it's looking at the people that I have on my teams and saying, what are the things about this person that I want to be more like? Mm. How are they as a parent? How are they as a leader? How are they as an athlete? How are they as a, uh, a spouse? How are they, you know, those types of things are what I look for in teams. And those are the things that I want to surround myself with in this next phase of my life, yeah. because I know I'm only going to get better if I'm compounding the, the best of this person, the best of this person, uh, and, and hopefully assimilating that knowledge into the best version of myself. That's a really cool answer. Cause I think there's the destination, there's the journey, and then there's the company with you on that journey. Yeah. And now you're like, hey, there's endless mountains I'm, I wanna summit, but like, I just wanna be on journeys that I'm inspired by and I wanna be with the right company That's as it. I do those things. That's it. I love that. I've really, really enjoyed this. I, I do. Like these were some really profound lessons. Thanks for being so open Yeah. Um, about your story. And I think there's some amazing gems in here. I gotta play these back. I'm very excited too, but thank you for sharing your story, man. And uh, hopefully we can do a round two with your next company. That'd be awesome, Chris. Thank you so much for having me. Awesome. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed this episode of the World Class Podcast. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe across all our platforms. Hit that notification bell so you can get updates on our new episodes. And we'll see you next week.